talk again about uh, compassion. Today we're going to talk about conflicts and compassion. So Lord, we do thank you for helping us not only to understand your word, but to apply your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12. Once again, we want to define our terms, so we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, when we talk about compassion, we're talking about sorrow for the sufferings or trouble of another or others accompanied by an urge to help. So it's not just feeling bad for somebody, all right? It's want, letting that move you to be a help. Okay, Colossians chapter 3 and verse, we're going to start in verse 12. The whole chapter is about uh, our new life in Christ, how we should act. And right in the middle of this is, uh, it says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, that's, that's us. Okay, if, if you're in Christ, if you're born again, he's talking about you right now. All right. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether it's in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Okay. So let's go back here. If I am a believer... If Jesus Christ is my Lord, if I, have, if I have asked him to be my Savior, I have to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. I have to put that on because it's not naturally part of who I am. Amen? Uh, Pastor Ray alluded to it earlier. Remember back in the days B.C., before Christ? Amen? We weren't known for our great compassion, humility, kindness, and all these other things. We have to put that on. And if it's not uh, mankind at its core, because mankind at its core is naked before God. Because that's what sin does to us. It exposes our nakedness. So that's not naturally part of who we are as people. We have to put this on. And God covers us with his glory, and that's what it looks like. We say things like, Lord, cover me with your glory. Lord, put your anointing on me. It's manifested through us acting out in compassion. It manifests itself when we are kind, when we're gentle, when we walk in humility. That's how God's presence is manifested to those around us. Now, you might say, but you know what? I, I struggle with that. I, you know, every once in a while, my flesh, my flesh shines through. Yeah, sure it does. You know, we, we put on clothes, and, and sometimes, you know, you forget a button or something like that, and you, you got something showing that you don't want to show. Amen? I can't tell you how many times I've gone up to speak, and the first thing you got to do, we, we used to tell everybody this at Bible school. First thing you do is you... Check your fly. <laughs> Why? Because you don't want to show everything. And if you feel like your flesh is showing, button up. Amen? Sometimes we need to button up because our flesh is showing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because see, I got I got to remember this one thing, and I got to remind myself constantly, is that it ain't about me. It's about Him. Amen. And that's the one challenge we have in the body of Christ: is that we we evolve everything around ourselves. 
You know, it, it, and we've, we've said this many times before. If you were to ask people, who is the central figure of the Bible? And people would say, of course it's God. And you would be right in saying that. But many times we, we make ourselves the center of the Bible because we look at the scripture as what's best going to be for me and how I can get my stuff and how I can justify my position. And I very, not, not necessarily on purpose, but that's just part of our, our, our human condition is I can very easily make myself the center of the Bible. The thing about compassion, and, you know, and God has this, this, just this nasty way of doing it. Compassion, many times, God calls us to direct it towards people that we don't think necessarily deserves it. Or is that just me? Now, fortunately, the Bible tells us how to deal with that. And we find that in the book of Jonah. Okay. Now, we're not going to go through the entire book because time will not allow us to do that. Okay. But Jonah was a prophet of God. And uh, in all, uh, other places in the Bible where it talks about you, he's a pretty, he's a pretty good one. Well, God comes to Jonah in, in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1. He says... Uh, Go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. I want you to go and I want you to prophesy against the city. They are wicked. And they were. They were just downright despicable. And they were horrific towards the Jewish people. And if you were to ask any uh, person in Jerusalem at that time or any prophet in Israel, uh, who would you like to see some judgment poured out on? He would probably say, I'll start with Nineveh. So God tells him, he says, I want you to go and I want you to prophesy against them. And Jonah being the obedient servant he is, just like the rest of us, he said, no. <laughs> uh -uh. And he takes off and he finds himself a boat. He pays his passage and he says, I'm getting as far away from this as possible. Now, he, he should ought to know better, all right? Just like the rest of us. How do you hide from somebody who's everywhere? Where can you go from someone who is everywhere? So Jonah gets in the boat. They take off. A big storm comes in. Things are going crazy. They're, they're thinking, we're going to sink. We start tossing out all the luggage and all the cargo, and it still looks like we're going to sink, and, and everybody starts praying to their own gods, and uh, nothing's changing, and they cast lots, and it falls on Jonah, and they go, all right, who are you, and what are you doing here? Jonah says, you know what? I'm a Hebrew, verse 9, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. That's a great thing to say as you're running away from him. Amen? And sometimes, sometimes we have a tendency of doing that. You know, we're, we're in rebellion, we're doing things that, or, we're, or maybe we're not doing what we should do, and we start getting real, rebel, real uh, religious all of a sudden. I want to make sure everybody knows just how, how, how obedient I am to God, how committed I am to him as I run from him. He says, uh, the men became extremely frightened. They said, how could you do this? Have you ever had somebody say that to you? Maybe, they're, maybe at work, or maybe somebody that knows you're a Christian, they look at you and say, you know what? I, I, I thought you was a, a Christian. How, how could you do this? We, we've all experienced those times. They said, uh, what do we do? What do we do? You're a prophet. You tell us what to do. He comes up with an idea. Throw me overboard. Okay. I'm a prophet of God. I, I, I serve the Lord God, God of land, God of sea. And right now, the only thing that I can think of is chuck me overboard. They didn't want to do that. Okay. They rode. They, they rode harder, harder. It, things got worse. So finally they said, you know what? Chucking you overboard seems like a pretty good idea. And so they did. They threw him overboard. And as soon as they did, 
the storm stopped. Now, in verse 17, it says, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I have lived in some small places in my day. Okay. But being in the belly of the fish, is, it's awful small in there. Amen. He, he, was not, he was not swallowed by a whale like you see in the cartoons where he's got this big old cavern and he's just sitting there, you know, and just wondering what's going to happen next. No, he is in the belly of a fish. And if you think the outside of a fish makes your hand smell, the inside makes it smell even more. Amen. What's he do? I'm in a belly of a fish, not just for an hour. I'm in there for three days. First off, it's a miracle that, that, that he didn't die. Okay. What do you, what do, you do? You pray. <laughs> Chapter 2, he starts praying. He starts worshiping. He starts calling on the name of the Lord. That was a very smart thing for him to do. Okay. And then he, in verse 9 he says, I'll sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay salvation from the Lord. And it says, then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on dry land. Now, I will tell you right now, being in the belly, first off, being swallowed by a fish is, is, is in and of itself a very traumatic experience. Okay, I've never experienced it, but I did see Jaws uh, a couple times. All right, it's kind of a kind of a goofy, weird experience, and and then being in the belly of a fish for three days is because not only are you in the belly of a fish, you got all the other stuff in there with you, and it's dark and you can't see and you can't move and all this stuff. But then to have him vomit you up on land is just an experience all in of itself. Amen. Because you're in the dark for three days. And all of a sudden, things start changing. You get bapped, you know, and you're like, you know, you go falling out. Because it didn't say he, he, he gently handed him over to the sea. He did not gently place him on land. It says he vomited him out on the sea, on the dry land, I'm sorry. Okay. You think the sand stuck to your feet before? Yeah, you got, you got, you got fish, whatever, all over you. You got sand stuck to you. you got, you've been in there with these digestive juices for three days. I mean, he was a sight. <laughs> Amen. He was not like a preacher you see on TV with a nice suit and good hair and he was, yeah, he was nasty. He was, he was not the guy that you look at and say, if that's serving God, sign me up. Nah, he's just puked out on land. And the Bible says in chapter 3, in verse 1, it's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible it gives me hope it says now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time church there's so many people who are in the body of Christ who have just royally messed things up and you thought God certainly is, is done with me he, he obviously can no longer use me no, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God does not give up on us. Amen. God knows our frame. All right. He knows everything about us. He is not offended. He is not surprised by your mistakes. God responds to your mistakes through the cross. And when I understand that for myself, that should motivate me to have compassion towards others who have yet to experience that. Amen. 
So it says Jonah gets up, he goes uh, walking through Nineveh. Nineveh is a huge city, about three days worth of walking to get through the city. He starts walking through the city, proclaiming judgment. God's going to judge this place, your wickedness, and you know, and and it's like, isn't that the guy that just got blacked, you know, on the beach? Yeah, that's him. Boy, what a mess. And he began to preach the judgment of God and people of Nineveh, you would think that maybe they would mock him. Oh, you're the man of God? I just saw you get belched out of a fish, pal. No. They repented. Why? Because they recognized what he was, in spite of how he looked, that he was speaking the truth. See, people ask, they say, well, why did God send a fish to swallow him up? He was out to sea. He would have drowned. I'm sure he could swim, but not that good. Even though that fish was a horrific experience, it saved his life. And some of us are going through horrific experiences. And we think, surely I'm being judged by God for my sin. And yes, very well could be. But God's also saving your life. Because the Bible tells us when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants will learn righteousness. Amen. And sometimes we go through things that seem horrific on the outside because God is sparing our lives because he's not through with us yet. And thank God for it. So anyway, they, 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 they proclaim a fast and... In verse 10, it says in chapter 3, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared would, he would bring upon them, and he didn't do it. Now, Jonah, you would think, would be a little happy about this. People are getting saved. We're having a revival meeting. And he's not a happy camper at all. Verse 4, chapter, one, chapter 4, verse 1. It greatly displeased Jonah and became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, God, take, take my life, just take it, for death is better to me than life. See, he gives, up, he gives up the game here. He says, you know what, I, I told you when I was back at home and you told me go prophesy to these people and I'm filling in the blanks because it doesn't cover this in chapter 1 or 2 or 3, uh, but I said to you, I said, you know what, if I go there, they're going to repent and you're going to forgive them and I don't want that to happen. Why? Because I think these people don't deserve to be forgiven, I think they should be judged. What does the Bible say? God does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Why? Because God calls men everywhere to repent so that they can be forgiven. See, God's call to compassion, all right, which was, would, would have been, been as a result of their repentance, made Jonah very angry because he knew that they would be forgiven. And that's the last thing he wanted. And sometimes we find ourselves in that valley of decision when the Spirit of God begins to move upon us and says, I want you to talk to this guy at work and I want you to tell him how much I love him. I want you to tell him that, you know, he, the, you know that, that, He's going to go to hell if he doesn't accept me, and I don't want that. I want him to go to heaven with me, and that he needs to repent because I, I, I want to forgive him. And we go, uh, I would rather this guy get fired and get it. You know, I'd rather be working with somebody else besides this guy. I'll take a sick day. I know. Ah, uh -huh. bad idea, Jonah. What do you say? I went. I, I got on the boat. I went to Tarsus because I wanted to delay it. What? Delay what? Delay forgiveness. 
If I delay forgiveness, maybe a few of them will die and they'll go to hell like they should. That sounds awful harsh when you say it like that. But that's what was in his heart. And sometimes we find ourselves struggling with the same things. Besides, not only that, do you understand what, you know, like God, God doesn't, you know, what I just went through, I got swallowed by a fish, okay. I got puked up on the land, and I'm a mess, and, and you know, and, and I got this taste in my mouth from being in there and all this stuff. And, and, and I went, and I, and I preached, and everybody's looking at me, and I'm telling them how God's going to judge them, and I, and I did it with fervor because that's what I wanted, and uh, now I really look bad. Because everything I said was going to happen ain't going to happen now. Now I look bad. Well, it ain't about me. Sometimes it's more about me than I care to admit to. See, Jonah's consideration was for himself and not for the lost souls of Nineveh. Okay. He was pretty upset. I'll tell you right now, the people of Nineveh was pretty glad that he came. Why? Because they were spared. See, people are in trouble because of sin. All right? They are. Sin destroys not only in this life, but it destroys in the life to come. Okay. Um, I was telling someone the other day, we were, we were talking, and, and uh, we were talking about eternity, and I was reminding them, you know, the Bible says this mortal must put on immortality, okay, just the same way that we, we put on compassion, we put on kindness, we put on things. Every one of us has to put on immortality, okay? And I told him, I said, you know, in this respect, you don't get, a, you don't get to choose what you wear, but you do get to choose where you wear it. You can either wear it in the lake of fire or you can wear it in the kingdom of God. I will tell you right now, the kingdom of God is a lot better. But see, people are in trouble because of sin. And they need to know two things. Number one, that there is a holy God that will judge them. Okay? People need to understand that. You know, I, I, you, know you will hear people tell you as you witness to them, as you share the gospel with them, they'll say, uh, who are you to judge me? Only God can judge me. It's like, right. Do you understand that he will judge you? Okay. You're absolutely correct. And that will happen. And then the second thing is that same holy God will have mercy if they ask. Okay. You have a, a date with God. And that date is what the Bible calls the great white throne of judgment. And at that day, he will be your judge or he will be your savior. And the choice is ours. Okay. We are surrounded by people who are on their way to, this, to destruction. One of the worst things we can do as Christians is to have an apathetic attitude towards that. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't get caught up in the trap of saying, well, well, they're so far gone. I mean, gosh, they can't be saved. Or, they're such an irritant to me, I'd rather that they don't get saved. I don't like having them around me now. I certainly don't want them around me for eternity. It sounds really bad when you say it like that, huh? While we were yet sinners, that includes me. When I was at my worst spot, when I had no redeeming value at all, when I was on my way to destruction, God saved me. How can I not believe that he can save somebody else? See, our level of compassion is a reflection of our understanding of God's love for us. If I truly understand how, how much God loved me, then I in turn will love others. 
because the two commandments are love God, love your neighbor as yourself. If I understand how much God loves me, if I truly get it, I will reciprocate that love towards others. If I find myself wanting in that respect, I need to ask God for help, okay? I really do. If I believe, if I truly believe that the Bible is true and God wants all people to be saved because he tells us that in 1 Timothy 2, 4, okay? If I truly believe that, that God wants all people saved, that will give me a boldness and a confidence to talk to anyone about Christ. See, many times we give ourselves an out. We say, well, that person's not ready. Well, how do you know? Well, that person would just reject it. Well, how do you know? What if they do? So what? You still give them that opportunity. I don't write anybody off because God didn't write me off. Amen? And I need to understand something. At that time, the Holy Spirit will empower me. What did he say? He said, you'll receive power after the Spirit of God comes upon you so that you can have potlucks and fellowships and listen to good Christian music? No, he said, you'll receive power so you can be a witness. A witness to what? A witness to God's grace, God's compassion. Amen? And that's not just preaching to the choir. It's not sitting around in your living room talking to each other how much you love Jesus, even though those are good times and those are good things. But it's taking it, as the, the song says, taking them to the streets. Amen? Many times throughout the scriptures you read about the, the different miracles, and, I, and I, I want to encourage you, go through the Gospels, look at all the different miracles that Jesus performed. And, and, and many times it's, it's prefaced by this, it says, he was moved with compassion, and then this happened. Okay. Um, one of the challenges that we have in the body of Christ is that we say, you know, well, how comes we don't see any miracles? How come we don't see the, the amount of miracles that are in the Bible, and, and so forth and so on? And in a lot of places they do, okay? But if miracles is based on compassion, there's your answer. So my challenge to, to myself and my challenge to each one of us, okay, we work on the compassion end of things and let God work on the miracles. Amen? Begin to ask God and begin to work on your compassion towards others and watch God begin to work on the miracles. Amen? Because if, if, if I don't have compassion and I have some contempt for others, my desire for a miracle in their life is going to be based on my own self-righteous uh, approval. And it becomes about me again. And the Bible tells us that God does not share his glory with anybody. Amen. So I want to encourage you, begin, if, if you find yourself struggling with the area of compassion, okay, I will tell you right now, that, that is a struggle for me, all right? I'm not a, I am not a people person. I know it's a shock for a lot of folks, okay, but I, I'm, I'm not a people person. But I got to seek the, fa I seek the face of God and I ask him, I say, Lord, you help me with this. Help me manifest your anointing. Help me manifest your glory in this, you know. Help me to have an appreciation uh, for, for people. You know, and he does. He helps. He helps. Some days the suit don't fit very good. I got to button it up some more. Amen. <laughs> but hey, we're all we're on this road. Let's make the best of it, because it's going to be worth it in the end. Let's pray about that.